sheep have gone astray, but you have drawn us with your love and mercy and grace. Lord God, you met us when we were lost and undone, when we were sinners far from you. And Lord, you extended mercy to us and you extended love to us. Oh, hallelujah. We responded to that, God. And we began to repent of our sins and we began to turn from our wicked ways. Lord, as you separated us unto yourself, God, you begin to teach us your ways and you begin to show us life everlasting we gather here today to celebrate our salvation we gather here today to celebrate the fact that your mercy has separated us from our our destiny which was to be lost forever god you have given us new hope oh hallelujah we worship you today god we come before you today god celebrating this new hope that we have in you we come today god appreciating the fact that you have prepared for us a life full and overflowing with favor you said that you have come that we might have life and that more abundantly oh hallelujah 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 we gather together today hallelujah to enter into your gates with thanksgiving to enter into your courts with praise to be thankful and to bless your name for the Lord is good his mercy is everlasting and his truth endure to all generations generations. Oh, hallelujah. Saints of God, let's just begin to pray right now that God's will would be done in this service that he would, his voice would be heard in the name of Jesus we come against every distraction we come against everything that would try to hinder your voice today from being heard in this service God we pray Lord Jesus that your blood amen would protect us from the attacks of the enemy today in the name of Jesus we pray God against every which way the devil would try to hinder Lord we know that you have come today to give us a service us like none other. You desire God to pour out your spirit in this house. You desire God to heal somebody today. You desire God to restore somebody today. Come on saints, pray with me. In the name of Jesus, God, we're coming boldly before your throne of grace. We are a people that pray. We are a people that intercede. We are a people that seek your face. We are a people of God. Sons and daughters of the most high God. We have power with God and with man. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you for the authority that we have in you. We thank you for the authority we have through your name. Oh, we thank you for the authority we have through your blood today. In the name of Jesus, we come against principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness in high places. We take dominion and authority against everything that would lift itself up against the knowledge of God. Oh, hallelujah. We pray for revival. We pray for revival today. We pray for a spirit spiritual breakthrough today. We pray for a quickening today. We pray for an awakening today. Oh, hallelujah. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We thank you today, Lord God. Hallelujah. For everything that you have come to do in this place is beyond what we can imagine or even think. Hallelujah. Oh, let's worship him. Let's Praise Him. Let's give Him glory today. Hallelujah. Oh, lift your hands in the sanctuary and give God praise. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, we love you. We adore you, God. Oh, we praise you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We get out of ourself right now. Oh, hallelujah. We lose sight of ourselves. We are worshipers of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. We are worshipers of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, bless the name above every name. Hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Oh, let's all give a hand clap of praise unto him right now. Somebody raise your voice and shout with a voice of triumph. Oh, hallelujah. That's right. Lift up your shout of praise unto the Lord right now. We worship you, almighty God. We worship you, almighty God. We worship you, almighty God. Oh, hallelujah. We worship you, almighty God. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. 
casa Aleluia, 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 aleluia There is none like you, Lord We thank you today Oh, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God Oh, we worship you, Almighty God We worship you, Almighty God those of you that are joining us now, just, just begin to worship him. Begin to magnify his name. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you, Almighty God. We worship you, Almighty God. We worship you, Almighty God. We give your name the glory. We give your name the praise. We ask, we, we know God that without you we can do nothing. We're in awestruck wonder today of your presence. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hey, amen. I welcome you to this special Friends Day service under the direction of our 180 Truth Point Ministry. Amen. We're going to ask Brother Bowski if he'd just step up here just a moment, share with you what this service goal is all about. Then we're going to release our praise team to lead us in worship. Amen. And then we're going to have a service that flows with just a special touch of God, I believe, as each one of these presenters today get up and share what the Lord has put upon their heart. One more time. Let's all clap our hands under the Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. Well, in the practice of Christian apologetics, Pastor had the idea to put together a, this Truth Point 180 ministry. A Truth Point 180, in case you didn't know, starts out with a lie, a false doctrine, or a traditional belief that's false. And then after presenting the false, we do a turnaround, a 180 degree turnaround, and we correct the error and present it. It as the Bible teaches, but we do it in a way where if you, if you were talking to somebody on the street and they came up with one of those crazy questions that you'd be able to quickly, because a lot of people's attention spans aren't very long, you know, you could like correct it within three minutes and uh, you're done. You planted a seed. Of course, in the street itself, you probably have to go about a minute and a half and uh, you have to know doctrine. You know, the Lord expects us all to know his word. The, the students that are going to be speaking today have put in a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of prayer, and a lot of study to present what they're going to present today. I'm very proud of them. And out of all the students I've had for the decades I've been doing this, it is the best group of students I ever had. So you're in for a treat today, in Jesus' name.
that they were all in one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven when you get in one accord there's something about praise that draws us all together doesn't it as we are in one accord when we begin to praise the Lord whether you're new to praising God or whether you've been praising God all your life when you and I get in the presence of the most high God oh hallelujah it unites us into one accord it unites us into one voice oh let's praise him one more time hallelujah thank you Jesus glory hallelujah praise God praise God praise God you may go back to your seats not only do we get into one accord when we praise the Lord, we get into one accord around here when we hear the truth of God's Word. Amen. This church stands for truth. It stands, amen, for the apostolic faith. We believe, amen, that from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, you can find truth there in the Bible that will lead you to a closer walk with God. Amen. And I'm about to get out of the way here because we've got some presenters getting ready to come and share what the Lord has laid upon them. Amen. We'll hear a couple at a time, then we'll worship some more. So don't get, don't get too comfortable back there. And uh, uh, how many is going to preach with these as they preach or teach or whatever they're going to do? Amen. They need some feedback, all right? They need some encouragement. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sister Cox, go ahead and come. She's going to begin today. Give her a big hand.
Darwin's evolution or God's creation? One of the number one questions asked today and for many years now is, what should I believe? The theory of evolution or the Bible's account of God's creation? For a moment, I want to talk about how evolutionary thoughts has affected the study and opinion of the Bible and Christianity. For many believers, the first real attack they had felt against biblical account of creation was Charles Darwin's publication of The Origin of Species, which was written at a time when the Christian worldview was dominant in Western civilization. Darwin proposed that species can change over time, that new species come from pre-existing species, and that all species share a common ancestor. It's been documented that Darwinism has had a devastating effect on Christianity. Darwin suggested that God does not control the creation and that God's ways are not past finding out. But in the book of Job, God pointed out that Job didn't, didn't even know the answers to the little mysteries, like how God formed the world. But Darwin claimed that he could solve those mysteries. Surprisingly, there are those who call themselves Christian that actually hold a variety of views on the subject of Darwinism. A few believe that we evolved from lower life forms, but that God sovereignly directed and controlled this evolution. The difference between this view and Darwin's is that he states that evolution was not controlled by God, but rather took place by random mutation and were able to survive and reproduce successfully. Of course, this poses the question, what is the real meaning of life? Should we be singing our songs on Sunday with lyrics such as, reason why, reason why we exist, but there's no reason why? Take these points into consideration. If the universe were really the product of a chaotic Big Bang, then would it obey laws? Number two, a moral code of right and wrong only makes sense if there is a God who has created rules for us and to whom we are accountable. Number three, in Charles Darwin's book, the chapter called Difficulties of the Theory, even he says to suppose that the eye, with its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural, could not have been formed by natural selection. I freely confess, absurd. This is absurd at the highest degree. The last point I'd like for you to consider is this. A lot of creationists think that evolutionists would believe if creation, if it simply had more evidence. But the Bible tells us that people already have enough evidence of God's creation. Romans 1, 19 and 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The unbeliever already knows God, but he denies with his lips what he knows in his heart. Psalms 40 and 5 says, Many... Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of all your deeds, they would be too many to declare. So in closing, you don't need to understand exactly how God created us to believe that humans did not evolve. They were engineered by an intelligence far greater than ours, an intelligence that could have traveled through the universe, an intelligence that would want to make sure that we could live a happy and healthy life by providing all other life forms that we would need. When we see this, we will learn to appreciate the engineer's plans for us. I'm teaching on the logic of faith. Faith. Faith has been used in many ways. The logic of it has been used for almost anything you can think of. Will Michael Jordan have enough faith in himself to make that last second shot? Or will he miss under the pressure of the roaring Chicago fans? Faith has been used almost just as a plan B. Faith has almost been looked over. There's absolutely no way that this or that could happen. 
How is this even possible either way? Nowadays, faith has been less hoped for and less used and less used as something that could actually give them that second chance hope that they need. Using faith nowadays is almost determined by how big their situation is. Obviously, faith has been less used because there is no faith at all. There is no faith that something can actually be done. It is almost like there are too many things telling us everything that could go wrong. Faith is changing because of the viewpoint of how people see their situation. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 to walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible teaches us about Peter who walked on water. Faith, is, faith only to people is a small thing. Faith to some people is not even a thing to trust in at all. Like I said about faith being just as a plan B, that is not the way Jesus wants us to go through battles. The Bible tells us to put on the full armor of God. The Bible says to use, a, to use the shield of faith. God does not want us to use faith as a plan B, but it wants, he wants us to use it as our first attack in battle. In Matthew 17, 20, it says, Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, that you can say to this mountain, move from there, and it will move. Our Bible tells us that even the smallest faith can move mountains and help you every step of the way. It says, even us speaking out in faith, that it will happen, not maybe it'll happen, but the Bible bluntly tells us it will, the mountain will move and the power of his name working through you. Jesus' name, once for death, in Jesus' name. 
his honor, his praise. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God. You know, in a, in a room this size with this many people, there are so many needs that could be represented today. But isn't it wonderful to know there's one name that can take care of every one of those needs, no matter the situation? Why don't you call out on that name right now? Jesus' name. Speak the name of Jesus over your concern. His name is authority against all. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We walk in authority when we use the name of Jesus. Amen. The Bible says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name. In the name of the Lord. Praise God. You may be seated. We're going to be hearing now from Sister Barb Andrade and Sister Grace Sims as they come to share. God bless them. Give them a big hand. God bless you. How many times have you heard that or used it? What does it really mean? We say it in passing to someone sneeze or as a carefree goodbye. Maybe even an expression meaning, oh, you poor thing, God bless you. We may write it as a matter of fact ending on a card or a message. And if we wrote it, did we write it with a hopeful exclamation mark or maybe just a comma, kind of like a, you know, offhanded tagline. And besides, who am I to tell God who to bless? And with so little thought behind it. I mean, maybe it's only me, but I don't believe I put much thought in it except to worry afterward about what thought I was putting in it. I'm thinking it should have so much more potential meaning. Um, but it just sounds so cliche. You know, a phrase that's been used over and over again, and it has finally lost its meaning. The breakthrough came for me when I finally got out my dictionary and read the definition which is defined as a favor or gift bestowed by God, and thereby bringing happiness. And that's what I thought it would say, God blessing man. That is truly a blessing. God blesses everyone with life and with his love, and those who are believers are blessed with so much more. But the dictionary also says that a blessing is the invoking of God's favor upon a person. And invoking means to call upon a higher power for assistance, support, inspiration, man blessing man. Call has that strong sense of an expected response. When I call you, you'll pick up the phone. When I call for help, it will come. And then Paul settled the matter for me when he told the Romans how to live in their new capacity as Christians. He told them, bless them that curse you. Um, bless and curse not. What an amazing, out-of-the-box kind of thing to do for those of us um, that persecute us, hurt us, make life difficult for us, abuse us, irritate us, anger us, to invoke God to bless them, to call upon God to bless them and um, give them happiness, assistance, support, and inspiration. But if we bless them that persecute us, just imagine the blessings that we can bring down on the people, the brothers and sisters who walk this life with us. Blessings that we evoke with the ex expectation that God hears us and will respond. Blessings of health and comfort, abundance, wisdom, direction, strength, steadfastness, forgiveness, boldness, every need, every grace, even every breath. Used with understanding of its meaning and power and our responsibility to invoke it, God bless you is no cliche. It is no tagline. We need, we must bless each other. I know I will never use God bless you thoughtlessly again. And when I am blessed, I will respond with an immediate and heartfelt thank you. It's the worst way to start a conversation with your parents. I'm going to tell you something, but you have to promise not to get angry. 
This is a 100% foolproof way to ensure that they are going to get mad. Anger. We've all been taught it's a bad thing. Run from it. Avoid it. We just had two years of rampant anger. One group in the country was angry that you had to wear masks, and the other group was angry when people didn't. Why aren't you getting vaccinated? Hey, whoa, I'm not getting the vaccine. Be careful which political party, band, sports team, religious practice, or even pronouns you choose to criticize. Someone will get angry. When people get angry, it causes fights, wars, broken relationships, and death. Anger is the worst emotion. If you get mad, just calm yourself down and breathe. Don't let it call you into action. Nothing good can come from it. Plato once said, there are two things a person should never get angry about, what they can help and what they can't. So never get angry. Easy enough, right? Thanks, Plato. <laughs> but what if there is more to anger? Jesus gave us all of the emotions he has when he created us. He gave us the ability to get upset. He wouldn't give us something and then just tell us to always repress it, would he? He told us through his word to be angry and said not. Not that anger is a sin. God, before he was a man, got so upset at the unrighteousness of the world he created, he saved eight people and then flooded the entire earth. Righteous indignation. A sense of injustice and the wanting to change it. Just a reminder to you, Jesus never sinned once. So what are we getting wrong? Winston Churchill said, A man is about as big as the things that make him angry. We are getting upset about temporal things, and when we do that, it makes us smaller. Anger should be used to come into agreement with the mind of Christ. Anger is a secondary emotion to a preliminary hurt. If something doesn't hurt first, it won't make us angry second. So if you're not getting mad about the things God does, then you're not getting hurt by the things that break God's heart. If you're not getting angry, you're not in tune with God. All your emotions and the actions caused by them should ultimately be to the glorification of Jesus Christ. If guided solely by the Lord, the action which you take in response to your anger will heal rather than destroy. So I encourage you to get angry, but sin not.
you do, just raise your hands right now. Believe for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. He's come to heal your body. He's come to save your soul. He's come to turn your life completely around. He's here to provide everything you need. Hallelujah, hallelujah. This is a where he went to the home of Mary and Martha. And we know that uh, there was a great crowd that day. And those two sisters responded differently. Martha saw that they would need to have a meal. And so she went to the kitchen and began to prepare a meal. And she was working. And you can just imagine the anxiety she was under while she noted her sister wasn't in the kitchen with her. Mary was there in the room where Jesus was sitting at his feet, listening to everything that he was saying as uh, he spoke words of life to them. Martha came in and said to Jesus, Lord, tell my sister that she needs to be in the kitchen with me. And Jesus looked upon Martha with love and understanding, but he said to her, he said, she has chosen the better part. When we come together like this, and we get, we get in the presence of the Lord, it's, it's about allowing him to set our hearts on fire. It's about moving in the direction of the Lord. We can get so distracted by so many things. I don't want to get to the place where I am, I, I, I'm working for God, but losing sight of God in the process. Amen. I want, to, I want to stay sensitive to His Spirit. How about you? Can we just lift our voices, raise our hands one more time, and just tell Him we love Him. We love Him. We love Him. We love Him. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I worship you. I praise you, God. I move towards you, Lord, so that you can move in my life. I need a move from your spirit today. Amen. Praise God. Amen. The next two presenters we're going to hear from now is Sister Mary Howard and uh, Sister Cindy Feuerstein. Give them a big hand as they... of a higher power start okay thank you for some there are the unbelievers and doubters through which in their journeys have brought them to wonder at the existence of a higher power of love mercy and compassion betrayal and disappointments of life have corralled them in a deep well of despair in their unbelief and doubt 
and the disparaging outlook. Why bother, they say, when things happen no matter what, even when we cry out and reach beyond for hope and mercy. And this can become a mindset void of answers. That closes the door to their human understanding. That closes the door to their human understanding. And in their perception, this can become an expectation of signs and wonders. God is in charge, but he is not in control. When we choose to be in control of the decisions we make apart from his wisdom of wise counsel and guidance. Yes, in this life of uncertainty, this is the opposite now. <laughs> yes, in this life of uncertainty brought on by a sinful nature and desire through our own self-will brings struggle and strife which leads to emotional and physical confusion. But amid during life's feeling of hopelessness, we grow tired and wonder, wander in search of questionable direction for our own place in life. For me came that point where I chose in blind faith to embrace a love that drew me in time that I realized and learned who loved and knew me the most. A comfort and trust that healed my broken spirit, a longing and willingness that brought me to humble my searching and sincere heart and surrender to a childlike faith. A grace of merciful peace that I had never known surpassed all my human understanding. And so this is my personal experience that came in a life to trust in times of uncertainty, strength in the weight of trials, and courage for perseverance to tread forward. Self-reliance apart from realizing our own limitations can distance us from an all-knowing deity of power and wisdom. We forget that who we are and possess are in the powerful hands of who gives and takes away. So in my personal life and speaking through a life of wise and unwise experiences of decisions made, this is my testimony of a love that brought a very needed peace within, a glow of unspeakable warmth that embraces you with an assurance of love and forgiveness. This is what became and defined to me an all-powerful God of love and mercy who wonderfully gives to us who he is. Thank you. To claim or not to claim all that's yours. Eldrick Taunt Woods better known as Tiger Woods, topped the charts once again in 2013, claiming the title of world's greatest professional golfer for the 12th time in his career. King Tut, whose original name was Tutankaton, was nine years old when he claimed the throne of the 18th Egyptian dynasty. In the 1950s, BMW was having a very difficult time. However, son Herbert took control and did the impossible, making BMW one of the most respected, luxurious car brands in the world. Herbert's two children, yeah, now claims to the inheritance of $42.7 billion. Illinois is holding billions of dollars worth of unclaimed assets unless the rightful owners step forward. It is highly likely that the money and properties will go unclaimed. Known for, the, for having the best lost and found system in the world, Tokyo's six-story facility houses over 900,000 unclaimed items. Topping the list of unclaimed stuff, the umbrella. <laughs> Look around. Next time you visit a church, notice the number of unclaimed Bibles that have been left and separated from their owners. Now imagine a world in a day 
when there are no more Bibles. Ah, but we have the Bible apps that will save the day. Not always so, my friend. The thief is subtle. He has a plan, and he always has had a plan to kill, to steal, and then destroy. It is said that perhaps one of the saddest days in King Josiah's day is that the word of God was missing, and nobody missed it. So where are we going with all this claimed, unclaimed, and inheritance? Are you aware that you and I have been left with an eternal inheritance? Yet, to claim the inheritance of our Heavenly Father that was left to us, we must know what has been written. Written in Psalms are the verses, Bless the Lord O oh, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of our iniquities, who heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Amen. He has promised a more abundant life, and more importantly, he has promised a heavenly, eternal life. Search the scriptures. There is so much more. Claim or unclaimed, the choice is yours. Has he done anything mighty for you? I know he has. 
We've got a reason to praise him. Hallelujah. And the Lord, the word of the Lord says, if we don't praise him, somebody will. Amen. The rocks will cry out. Hallelujah. I don't want anybody to take my place. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. Our next two presenters coming at this time, Sister Cadence Cox, Sister Valerie Lokley. Give them a big hand as they come. Were dinosaurs really on the earth with humans in the Bible? What happens after death? Do all pets go to heaven? These are just a few questions I came upon when looking up some of the most frequently asked questions about the Bible. And although some may sound silly, I'm sure we've all thought these things at least once to ourselves. And as a girl who loved dinosaurs growing up and cares very deeply about the dog that she has now, I know I sure did. When you think about the Bible and new believers, we can all understand how overwhelming any topic could possibly be. There's a lot of new information to take in. There's a whole lot of different things up for debate, such as pets going to heaven. And by the way, for all the kids or adults listening, God would not send your dog to hell. I know that for a fact. Just watch all dogs go to heaven. When scrolling through this site, I noticed a question that stood out to me, one that should never be confusing. And that was, what is the importance of Christian baptism? So to begin, what is baptism? According to what Wikipedia has to say, baptism is a Christian sacrament of admission and adoption, almost invariably with the use of water into Christianity. But if someone asked me what it was, I would say it's the act of being submerged by water, representing rebirth or what you could call a second chance. Not to mention it's a very crucial step in the plan of salvation. In a more spiritual explanation, baptism cleanses you of all sin, creating, you in, creating in you a new being and making you fully washed. Pretty simple, right? Well, we humans like to make this confusing. There are about three different ways people are baptized in today's world today. Some by immersion, which is us, others by pouring, and lastly by sprinkling. Next, we find that some people baptize in the Trinity, or us, baptize in Jesus' name, which is the Father, and is the Son, and is the Holy Spirit. Colossians 2.9 and John 10.30 are two of many verses proving that statement. So I can understand why someone new to all of this would be so confused on baptism. Why are there three different ways? Are they, all, are they all correct? Well, for starters, there's not supposed to be three different ways, and no, they are not all correct. But don't take my word for it. Let's look at what the Bible says about baptism. First off, is it in Jesus' name or the Trinity? Well, Acts 2.38 clearly says that we are to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. That's settled right there. Next, how are we to be baptized? The word baptized in the Greek language means baptizo, and the definition of that word literally means to dip, immerse, submerge, or plunge. If the Bible meant sprinkling, it would have said rantisma, which means raining lightly. And that's enough proof for me, but if you need to think about it logically, if you were to go outside and got muddy, I don't think you would sprinkle water on yourself to clean yourself. No, you would fully submerge yourself in that water to clean it thoroughly, which is exactly what baptism does for your soul. So to end this debate, the Bible clearly states Jesus' name baptism, and it is to be done in full immersion. If you are looking for that kind of baptism, you have found the right place to do it. I encourage you to read more about this and about the plan of salvation. After all, God is not the author of confusion. One of the hardest things for people to do today is having patience. Waiting can seem like forever for some and can affect people's moods. Everything needs to happen right now at no cost to their personal life. Like taking food that your mom made and putting it in the microwave. In order to achieve good things, you have to have patience. It's like at the start of a TV show, an episode comes out. It gets good and ends on a cliffhanger. Then you wait and you wait for the next episode just to find out it's delayed. So now you wait and you wait some more. The anticipation eats you alive, and you can't wait to see what happens. You watch the next episode, and the cliffhanger is resolved. You can go on with your life without wondering all the time. Nowadays, people use servers such as Netflix, Hulu, and HBO Max. These servers allow you to binge watch TV shows up until the most recent episode. So there's no waiting involved, except when you have to wait for the next season to come out. Waiting is a part of the process. Without waiting, there is no growth, and good things come to those who wait. So take the advice of the old saying and hold on a little longer. It may be hard, but God will come through, and after waiting and 
After your waiting and trial, you will know why everything happened. I've experienced lots of waiting in my life, lots of uncertainty, but reminding myself about how far God has brought me has helped me get through. After all, diamonds aren't formed overnight. They are crushed, beaten, and burned to a crisp. Life can feel a lot like this in the waiting period, but hold on, a diamond will be formed in no time. Now, this isn't saying that you don't have to work during the waiting process. The ants in Proverbs 30 are not people and they are not strong. However, they prepare food in the summer for the winter so they can survive. They need to work on the off season to have food for the winter season. If you don't pray during your off season and don't put your faith in God, you won't be strong in your on season. You have to work to get good things. Setbacks will occur, but having faith the size of a mustard seed will give you comfort in the heartache. The Bible says today is hard enough, so do not worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will have its own challenges. It also says do not be anxious about anything. Instead, pray and spread thanks. Tell God everything. In return, God will fill you with his peace which will guard your heart and mind. When you are getting impatient in the waiting period, you can become anxious, but put that anxiousness on God and ask for peace. He will deliver. So hold on tight, little cookie. <laughs> Kick your shoes off and grab some popcorn and stay a while. Because once this waiting period is over, you will be entering a new season of your own TV show. And that first episode of the next season will be amazing. Or the second, or the third. One of them will be amazing. And you will encounter another off season of waiting once the next one ends. But take a deep breath, be still, and know that he is God, for there is no impossible for him. If, you're a patient, if your patience is running thin, hold on to it, because God will rebuild it. Always remember, love is not only kind, but it is patient. How wonderful to hear all those wonderful words of, of wisdom. So much to think about. I trust that all of you will think about these lessons over the next few days and just kind of let them roll around in your mind. There's a lot of wisdom to pull from. We've got some good things coming up. Um, today we have a hyphen lunch right after church. And then uh, Tuesday there is a More for Joy breakfast right here at church at 9.30. And uh, it's Friday night. There's a Mama Musings at 7.30. 7 o'clock here at the church. 7 o'clock here, here at the church. And then next weekend, we have our Kinetic Weekend. Uh, it's, it's geared towards those that are younger, but aren't we all young? So we all want to come right. and, and just be part of that. We're really yeah. excited about it. It'll be at uh, 6 o'clock on Saturday night. And then they'll have something for the Kinetic uh, group after uh, the 6 o'clock. But then again on Sunday morning at 10. So praise God. If we can, let's pray for our offering. And I'd also like to pray that we would... Um, as I said, keep some of these thoughts in mind. We've heard about evolution, faith, uh, the phrase, God bless you. We've heard about um, right, how to use anger, claimed versus unclaimed, um, self-reliance, the importance of baptism, the importance of patience. Beautiful thoughts. Let's pray for this offering today. And um, after we're done with the prayer, feel free to come up and bring your offering. But let's just love on the Lord and thank him for everything that he's done for us. Lord Jesus, we adore you today, God. We magnify you, Lord. Lord, we trust, God, that you will help us to remember all these things that we are hearing, Lord. Lord, let them roll around in our minds, God, so that we can serve you and be more sure of, God, what we believe and really act it out. Lord, take this offering today and use it to further your kingdom. Use it to further your kingdom so that all might know who you are. Oh, and adore you and put their trust in you in Jesus' name.
Hallelujah. The fullness of the Godhead. Amen. Jesus is not in the Godhead. The Godhead is in Christ. Amen. And we know that in him dwelleth all the fullness, the Bible says, of the Godhead bodily. Praise the Lord. Our final two presenters today is none other than Brother and Sister Bowski, who helped lead this, uh, this class that was uh, held a few months ago. We appreciate Truth Point Ministries directors. Give them a big hand as they come at this time. The Lord bless you. Scientists, psychologists, and others have long debated the theory of nature versus nurture. Those siding with nature state our choices and behaviors are a direct result of our genetics and other unchangeable factors. Those advocating for the nurture view argue that our environment, such as our home life, training, worldview, determine our outcome. As human beings, we long to understand, and in particular justify, our actions and thought processes. Why do we behave the way we do? Wouldn't it be great if all of the bad stuff we do really isn't our fault and all of the good stuff just sort of happens on its own? Well, there's a certain amount of relief that comes from subscribing to the nature view. After all, if we're all born this way and have little control over what we become, it absolves us of all responsibility for how we turn out. With that loss of responsibility, however, comes the loss of freedom to change who we are. If nature is why we are this way, then no matter how hard we try, we'll always go back to what we were before. Most people struggle with willpower on a diet. How then can we be expected to maintain willpower over the course of our entire life? Those supporting nature as the determining factor develop a fatalistic view and wander through the universe with no real power to control anything in their life. On the opposite end of the spectrum is the opinion of those contending that nurture is responsible for our development. If the environment is good with loving parents, needs provided, appropriate education, and abundant opportunities, this translates into positive behaviors and outcomes. That's wonderful news for all those who came into life with near-perfect condition. But what about all the rest of us? Those with families of long histories of dysfunction, mental or physical challenges, environments with poverty, crime, and poor education. Apparently, they're all doomed to face a life of substandard existence. So you may feel inclined to accept the view of nature, or you may be um, siding with the nurture perspective. Perhaps you feel it's a mix of both. But what if? What if there is a third option? What if the direction of our lives doesn't have to be decided by fate or by family? This life, the only life that we have, isn't a mere pawn in some universal game of chance beyond our control. It's not nature versus nurture. It's nature versus nurture versus new birth. 
greater than nature and more influential than nurture is the new birth provided to anyone who chooses to receive this gift from God himself. We are all offered this opportunity to overcome the lack in our genetics, family history, environments, and bad decisions and receive a fresh start. This new birth gives us a second chance to have the life we've always dreamed. As we are born again in Christ through seeking and receiving forgiveness for the errors of our old life, being washed clean through water baptism in the name of Jesus, and receiving his Holy Spirit into our lives, we can live a life beyond the control of nature and greater than the pull of nurture. Whatever we have experienced previously can, in just one moment, be conquered by the power of this glorious new birth. Whether you feel you have had every advantage in life, or if it seems that the deck is always stacked against you, you have the opportunity right now to say yes to the very best. There is nothing greater than to be born again into this new life. Amen. 35 years of marriage and her smile still stops me dead in my tracks. Are those, were they those students tonight, weren't they the greatest? I knew that was going to be good, but. Now I can derail the train. For today, nah, it'll be all right. Nobody likes to be lied to. One of the big lies since the beginning has been, if God is a God of love, why does he allow suffering? Lucifer had been created as a beautiful, talented archangel. He was so positive in his appearance, talent, and position, he told himself that he should be worshipped as God. But he found out the truth wasn't so positive, and he got kicked out of heaven. So then he set his sights on the residents of the garden, twisting God's word just enough to trick the woman. She offered the fruit to her husband, and he probably thought, this is the only woman I have. Would it be so wrong? Nah, it'll be all right. Then feeling guilty, they took the leaves and made clothes out of them to cover up what they did. When God asked them what they did, they lied by passing the blame around. Actions have consequences. Before the actions come the lie. People tell themselves that what they do is good, at least for themselves. They think, maybe I shouldn't do it. Nah, it'll be all right. Truth is not an option, it's the reality. Just because somebody sounds positive doesn't make it true. There are many kinds of lies, big lies, white lies, little lies, outright lies, and lying to yourself. Mankind has gotten pretty creative with lies since that day in the garden. The last 300 years have produced some of the biggest and most blatant lies in history, to the point where almost everybody believes them even though a little common sense and reasoning would disprove them, we tell ourselves, nah, it'll be all right. The Bible eventually, the Bible says eventually humanity will get to the point where in order to ease their conscience, they will make themselves creatively stupid, denying the creation, the flood, and the final judgment. We can't have things like that ruining all our fun and cluttering up our positive thinking, can we? Lies have to be reinforced. Left to themselves, they fall apart on their own. Truth can be covered up, but it will eventually be revealed. God said in the last days it would be so bad that the warning of the hour would be, be not deceived. In fact, so many lies would be told that even the tellers of lies would be lied to. Despite what the Word of God warns people about, People always change the meaning to something that is more pleasing to what they want to believe. That's why in Old Testament times, after the people had gone too far and judgment was coming, the false prophets always gave positive, encouraging declarations. After all, God is merciful. God is merciful, but he's not a liar. If he says you will be punished if you keep doing something, he has to punish you. People say, if people feel good about themselves, they are more likely to live for God. Traditional Christian history has shown us if people feel good in their sin, they are more likely to say, nah, it'll be all right. 
Truth is a separator, and there are consequences for lying. Would you stand together with me today? Truth does have consequences. What we believe matters. Choosing to believe or not to believe is still a choice. It is imperative that we all decide once and for all what we are going to believe. It's not enough to believe for just part of our life and then let it go when we get older. But we need to make sure that we are continually focusing upon the truths of God's Word. I want to leave you with just a quick verse of Scripture from Ephesians chapter number 1. And I, I want to make Paul's prayer my prayer for you today. And this Scripture speaks of great lofty truths that the Lord wants us all to know. Paul said, I pray for you, and as pastor of this church, I pray this for you as well. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation of the knowledge of Him. That the eyes of your understanding would become enlightened. That you would know what is the hope of His calling. What is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in his saints? What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of that power. Such power that was wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion. Above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. That is my prayer. That is the Apostle Paul's prayer. That each one of us today would have an understanding. That the eyes of our heart would be enlightened to know what is the hope of his calling. The Bible lets us know that wherever the word of the Lord is presented in whatever format that it's presented, that it, when received and mixed with faith, can produce in the life of the individual the miracle that that God wants it to be. And I wonder today, with your eyes closed, if you have heard something today from these 10 presenters, that you have been reminded of some truth of the word of the Lord. Maybe the Lord just caused one thing that was said or multiple things that was said to just remind you that he loves you and that he cares about you. If you're here today and you want the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened, that you may also know the hope of the calling of God, I I think it would be in order today to just spend a few moments around the front of this building come down here humbly and submit it and say, Lord, open the eyes of my understanding. God, give me vision. Give me hope today. Help me to have a true wisdom because this world has led me astray. This world has caused me to to leave the path that has been laid out by your word. And I I have gotten lost in the Would you join me around the front here today as we spend the final few moments of this service? I wonder if we could just seek the Lord together. I wonder if we could just say, Lord, it is our desire to know you. It is our desire to know your word. It's our desire to be able to allow your word to come in like a light that enlightens our entire entire life, that leaves behind a hope beyond anything that we could ever imagine. A hope that's not only just for this world, but a hope that is for the world to come. A hope that maketh not ashamed. A hope 
that we can hold on to and a hope that will hold on to us. It's not just cliche. It's not just religion. It's not just going through some kind of ritual uh, or ceremony, but it is a life-transforming power. It is a hope that raises us to newness of life. It is a power that raised Christ from the dead. That if it is in you, it will also raise you. It will lift you. It will cause you and I to rise above the fallenness all around us. The despair and the brokenness of this world will begin to fall beneath us as we rise in this hope. As we rise in this hope today. Oh, hallelujah. I believe that somebody needs to be refreshed in your spirit today to believe God in hope for great things to happen. Would you just reach out to the Lord right now? Would you just begin to talk to God today? Hallelujah. If it's been a long time since you just gave voice to what you feel inside of you, I encourage you today to talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord a few moments here in closing. Talk to the Lord about all that you're going through. Talk to Him. Talk to Him about your concern. Talk to Him about your burden. Talk to Him about your fear. Talk to the Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible says He's not far from any of us if happily we will but feel after Him. And we reach for Him today. We reach for Him who is reaching for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. There's hope today. There's blessed hope today. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for this hope today, God. Why don't you just reach out to the Lord right now. Let him fill you with this reminder. The hope, the hope, the hope that maketh not ashamed. The hope of his calling. The hope of his word in our lives. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hope today. Hope today. Hope today. Glory to God. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We give you glory and honor and praise. Hallelujah. 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 I love you, Lord. Would you pray for somebody nearby you today? Maybe there's a need in their life. Hallelujah. Won't you just agree together? We agree together with my brother and my sister. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. 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 Open the eyes of my heart.
Glory to God. Amen, 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 amen. At First Apostolic Church of Steger, we offer many home Bible studies. We have Bible studies that uh, you can go through by yourself, take about an hour. It's a self-directed Bible study. We have a couple of those to offer. We have a five-week Bible study called From Grace to Glory. We also have 10-week and 12-week Bible studies. And these are taught by uh, different leaders in our church. Uh, Brother and Sister Bowski uh, are over this ministry. It's no longer called Home Bible Study. It's called Truth Point. And, uh, and a part of the Truth Point ministry is, are these 180s these three-minute presentations of truth. Did you, did you enjoy this today? Hey Amen. We sure enjoyed all these various ones. That, they did such a good job. And uh, it was a buffet of truth today. We heard, we heard all kinds of different things. And uh, it's like, you know, if you, go to, if you go to Old Country Buffet and you leave hungry, that's your fault, not, not anybody else's. So you heard something today. We're going to have a special moment right now for the class. And uh, so all of those that were a part uh, of today, uh, if you could uh, make your way to the front here. And uh, maybe those, if you don't mind backing up, that are here, that were here for prayer. Amen. As we mentioned back in February, I believe it was, uh, we had six nights of special classes that was held on Thursday night. And uh, if there is desire uh, uh, within the congregation of others that would like to do uh, this kind of thing, go through this class, please see Brother Bowski or Sister Bowski. And in, in, in the future, we will line up another class for those that would like to go through. But uh, we want to just have the uh, Sister Bowski join us, Sister Cox join us, if you would. And um, Brother Bowski, you got some special things there for him. Let us know. Because it took courage to even put your name on the list to do this thing, and then took courage to do it, we're going to recognize the courage that you took and you put into action. I'm um, a big one on, on, on you showed me that, you're, that you've got courage. I mean, you're, you're there, man. You're there. So I'm going to have Sister Tammy come up, and she's going to read these names. As you hear your name called, come up, and we have got a certificate of achievement suitable for framing. All right. Sister Barb Andrade. <laughs> Sister Grace Sims. Sister Valerie Local. Sister Mary Howard. Sister Cindy Feuerstein. Brother Kerrigan Cox. Sister Cadence Cox. And last but not least, Sister Alyssa Cox. Praise the Lord. Amen. Elder Brother Wellman, would you come up and dismiss us today? Amen. We appreciate everybody being here in the house of the Lord. And uh, what a great time together as we have heard from the Lord and received from him today. Well, he didn't let us down, did he? Nobody remembers that Thursday night, do they? Elder Brother Wellman, thank you, Pastor. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, while we were singing that song that, that there, the last... The last few words of that, 
I want to see him. And the thought came to my mind, how many of us standing in that can hear my voice right now, do we really want to see him? How many of us really want to see him? Really, really want to see the nail-scarred hands. Really want to see the one that gave his life so that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Do we really want to see him in this old sick world that we live in today? Does stuff bother us anymore? Do we have any convictions at all? Do we really want to see him? I want you to go with that thought. Lord, do I really want to see you? Am I living the life that I really want to see you? It just struck me. It hit me like a ton of rocks. I already knew the pastor was going to ask me to dismiss just from that right there. It just hit me so hard. And uh, I feel I needed to share that with somebody here right now for all of us. You know, Lord, I want to have a repentive heart more than anything. God, I want to see you. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. I want to be ready when he comes. And I believe it could be any moment, any moment. Let's all go to prayer. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for what has taken place here today. I pray your blessings upon each and every one that participated. I pray your blessings on each and every visitor that we have with us today, God. I pray that you'll go with them that you'll bless them throughout this week. I pray that they felt something here today, Lord. I pray that in each one of our hearts that you'll put a stirring, Lord, that we definitely want to be ready and we definitely want to see you, Lord. Let that be the main purpose in our life, God. Lay it on us really strong this week, God. Bring us back at the appointed time this Thursday. Bless our services, God. Bless our kinetic revival next week, God. Have your precious way, Lord. We love you. I thank you for all my brothers and sisters, God. Pour your blessings out upon them this week in the wonderful name of Jesus. Everybody said, Amen. Amen.